Hello everyone, welcome to our channel I teach. I am starting a new series today, quick revision series and in this first of all I will begin with the history and in history modern India. In this series I will try to give maximum information in a very short time which will be very useful for the exam points of point of view especially prelims. First of all let me discuss what is history. History is the recorded or written past of the humanity. If not written it is prehistory. Let's talk about Karl Marx's contribution in the study of the history. Scientific contribution of history from him. The economics is the base of civilization. It is known as material dialectism. What is it is known as? Weber's contribution. Weber's contribution is also significant though in lesser amount in civilization of history. Weber also utilized dialectics and developed dialecticism. There were interaction in between thesis and antithesis which results in synthesis. Marx believed that Weber had used dialectism in a wrong way. Marx says before civilization there were no classes only when there is surplus and civilization develops then the classes, exploitation, discrimination and categories of haves and have nots emerge. In the medieval period, though exploitation continued, position of masters were taken up by feudal lords and in places of slaves are the serfs. Serfs are better off than slaves. In the modern period, the position of feudal lords were taken up by the capitalist or bourgeois and in places of serfs came the proletariat. In ancient, if we talk about, there were four main civilizations and these were Mesopotamian, Egyptian, Harappan and Chinese civilization. Mesopotamian civilization were along the rivers of Tigris, Euphrates river valley and Egyptian civilization was along the Nile river valley, Harappan civilization was along the Indus Saraswati and the Chinese civilization was along the Hong Ho river in southern China. Ancient civilization mainly developed in Asia or nearby Asia and Eastern Africa. Then came classical civilization or regional empires, Greek or Roman civilization, Socrates, Plato, or Aristotle have talked about this. The earliest inscription found in Indian subcontinent other than in the inscription is the Bahistun, Sin province of Pakistan in 518 BC. Indian region and making its Satrapi or 18th province of Persian. Let's talk about the and in the world Alexander took over from the Persia, took over the Persia and after death of his empire was divided. Citizens of Rome ruled whole Europe plus West Asia plus North America. That was peak of classical civilization. Europe gave a death blow to the Roman Empire. Also there were barbarian attacks. One portion of the Roman Empire redeveloped as Byzantine Empire or in Istanbul in the medieval period. Kushanan Empire set up by Cardphysis first from Central Asia to borders of China and India. His successor Kushan, the greatest Kushan king in India. Cardphysis set up the Silk Route. Now the medieval period. It roughly is from 700 to 1500 AD. First three centuries that the 700 to 100 AD early middle ages it was formative phase of feudalism and from 1000 to 1300 AD mature middle ages or the mature phase of feudalism and from 1300 to 1500 AD late middle ages or phase of feudalism decline. No European empire till then only Byzantine empire was, which was the offshoot of Roman empire was there. Arabic empire established by Prophet Muhammad first Islamic king expanded with Khalifa or Khalif in 632 and lasted till 1924. Kamal Pasha first military commander Turkish ruler of modern Turkey became republic. Turkey was under Ottoman Turk. Ottoman Turks replaced Arabic empire from 14th century and Mongol empire. Chinggis Khan one of the largest single handedly built by China. Chinggis Khan, his successor Kublai Khan, contemporary to Muhammad bin Tughlaq, Delhi Sultan, who were the Turks, replaced by the Mughals. Delhi Sultans were replaced by the Turks, and Turks were replaced by the Mughals, who set up Mughal Empire. 75% Turks and 25% Mongolians blood were there in Mughal Mughals. During medieval period, Europe declined. Asia was not dormant. 75% Turk blood and 25% Mongolian blood among the Mughals. During the medieval period, Europe declined. Asia was not dormant. It had Arabic to Mongol empire. Now let's talk about the modern period. It, from the late 13th century, East and West trade increased began. It revived the trade which led to the death of feudal system. In 15th century, suddenly the capture of Constantinople by the Ottoman Turks in 1453. It put pressure on Europeans to find alternative routes. They started taking life-threatening life voyages into the high sea. Peninsula, Portuguese and Spanish took the lead. Portuguese reached the southern tip of Africa via Cape of Good Hope and Vasco 
Vadagama reached India on 1498, that's 17th May 1498, and it marked the beginning of the European penetration in Indian subcontinent. And it's marked the beginning of modern age in India, arrival of Vasco da Gama. Then further, the Portuguese established their control over Cochin, Goa, island of Salcid and Basayan, as well as island of Bombay. In the beginning of 17th century, that 1602, the Dutch East India Company was formed and it established their factories there and they replaced the Portuguese. The Dutch were more interested in the Indonesian islands of the Java and Sumatra to, so as to procure spices from these places. The Dutch established their control over Pulikat and Nagapatnam and established their factories there. Over Pulik in Pulikat in 1610 and Nagapatnam in 1658. They also established their factories at Masuliputnam in 1605 and Surat in 1658. The English East India Company was established as a group of merchants known as Merchants Adventurers in 1599. This company was given the power by the Queen of Britain to trade with the eastern countries for a period of 15 years. So the pact was only for 15 years but this charter was extended for an indef indefinite period by James I of Britain on 31st December 1600. The first East, British East India Company sent a mission under Captain Hawkins to the court of Mughal Emperor that's Jahangir who was the son of Akbar and in the chronological order the mission sent by the Britishers the first was the Captain Hawkins, Hawkins and the second one was the Edward and third one was the Sir Thomas Rowe. Jahangir gave permission to establish a factory in, at Surat in 1612 but first factory of English East India Company was already established in 1611 at Masuli Patnam. In 1662, there was a matrimonial alliance between the Prince Charles of Britain and Catherine of Barigenza of Portugal. As a dowry prize, the Portuguese gave the island of Bombay to the Prince of Britain. However, the island of Bombay was handed over to the English East India Company in 1668. Further, going to the going to the eastern part of the India in 1639, Francis Day, a local ruler who was an administrator associated with the British East India Company, gave Madras on lease to the British East India Company. The English East India Company erected a fort at this place, which was named as Fort Saint George. The penetration of the English East India Company to the eastern India was quite late in 1698. The British East India Company or three villages from a local ruler whose name was Azim Ushan on lease. These three villages were Sutanati, Kalikata and Govindpur. These three villages were amalgamated into a single unit and a fort was constructed at this place which came to be known as Fort St. Williams, our famous Fort St. Williams. In 1664, the French East India Company came and formed and they established their first factory at Surat. Then they established their second factory at Masuli Patnam in 1668. They were seen as the rivals to the Britishers and the conflict arose in between the two. And the, the chronological order which we have studied till now comes that first came the Portuguese, then came the Dutch, then Britishers and then French. So now moving to our second topic the carnatic wars these wars are very important and in, in three to four years one or second two questions come from here also the first carnatic war which was fought between the 1746 and 1748 it this battle is known as the first battle of modern india between the native indians and the foreign powers the first carnatic war was an extension of conflict between Britain and France in Europe in the Austrian War of Succession which was g going in, Br in Austria in between 1742 and 48, 1748. This war came to an end in 1748 by the signing of the treaty, the Treaty of Aix La Chapelle that was signed on October 18, 1748. This treaty marked the end of conflict between the two trading companies in India as well. Here one important thing is that the, the battle which was fought during the first Carnatic War is the Battle of Santhom 
that was fought between the Anwaruddin who was being supported by the Britishers versus Chanda Sahib who was being supported by the duplex. Duplex was a French governor general. French governor general. In contrast to the reasons of the first Carnatic war, the reasons for the second Carnatic war were provided by the political situations in India regarding the who would be the successor of the Hyderabad state after the Nizamul Mulk who was the founder of Hyderabad state and the Wazir or the Governor General of the Muhammad Shah, the Mughal Emperor at Delhi. The French Governor Duplex decided to support the claim of Muzaffar Jung and Duplex, Duplex was successful in installing Muzaffar Jung on the throne of Hyderabad. Duplex deputed his trusted General Basi in the court of Hyderabad. Muzaffar Jung died within a short period and Basi raised the next successor, Salabad Jung, as the Nawab of Hyderabad. Salabad Jung, in lieu of his support, gave four district of Andhra which was collectively known as Northern Sarkars. Northern Sarkar. These four districts were collectively known as the Northern Sarkars and the names of these districts are Mustafa Nagar, Alor, Rajamundri, Chikakol. These developments were not acceptable, not acceptable by the British East India Company and they started fight with the French East India Company which marked the beginning of Second Carnatic War and the duration of the Second Carnatic War was 1749 to 1754. The war came to an end by the signing of the Treaty of Pondicherry in 1754. Here, the, the important treaties which mark the end of the war are important and the chronological order and the important battles are really very important from the exam point of view. So, two battles which were fought during the Second Carnatic War was the Battle of Amir in which the Duplex was defeated. Du Duplex defeated English and another battle was fought was Battle of Arini in 1751. Here Duplex was defeated by Clive of Britain and English captured Arcot which was the capital of Carnatic. In the meantime seven years war of succession seven years war from the French 1756 to 63 broke out in Europe between Britain and France. The reverberation of this struggle in Europe was seen even in India. This struggle marked the beginning of Third Carnatic War between British East India Company, between British East India Company and the French East India Company in 1758. The decisive blow to the French East India Company was given by the British East India Company at the Battle of Von de Vosch that was fought in 1760, in which English General Sir Eyre Coote, his name is very important, defeated the French officer Count de Lally. This marked the Bahadur Shah adopted aggressive, strict or aggressive policies only against Banda Bahadur. Who was Banda Bahadur? Who? Banda Bahadur was the first political rule, ruler of Sikh community. However, Bahadur Shah couldn't defeat and subjugate Banda Bahadur in Punjab itself. Here, important extra information is Chura Manjad of Bharatpur, Rajasthan supported Bahadur Shah in his battle against Banda Bahadur, but to no avail. Bahadur Shah was succeeded by Jahanda Shah, whose reign was from 1712 to 1713. Jahanda Shah came to power with the help of active support of noble Zulfikar Khan. Zulfikar Khan abolished the discriminatory policy of Jazia from Mughal Empire. So what was Jazia? Jazia is a per capita yearly taxation historically levied in the form of financial charge on permanent non-Muslim subjects of a state governed by Islamic law in order to fund public expenditures of the state in place of zakat that Muslims are obliged to pay. So Jahanda Shah next was succeeded by the Farooq Siyar as the later Mughal, next Mughal, later Mughal Emperor. Farooq Siyar came to power with the support of Sayyid brothers or famously known as the Kingmakers and their name were Abdullah Khan and Hussein Ali Khan. Hussein Ali Khan was younger one. These two brothers are also known as Kingmakers. Farooq Siyar wanted to get rid of the Sayyid brothers but Sayyid brothers proved to be too clever and Sayyid brothers with the help of support of Balaji Vishnath who was Maratha Peshwa defeated and killed Farooq Siyar. So Kingmakers were again victorious. After this Muhammad Shah who was famously known as the Muhammad Shah Rangila was made the next Mughal Emperor with the help of his Wazir Nizam ul Mulk or the founder of founder of 
Hyderabad state. He ruled from 1719 to 1748. Here, in the meantime, due to the domestic problems, the later Mughal emperors couldn't give due attention to the northwest frontier province as was the history of India from the time immemorial. These were northwest frontier, northwest frontier province was always a point of contention. Whoever controlled better that region controlled India. As such, the Persian ruler Nadir Shah decided to attack India to extract wealth from India. And on 13th Feb 1739, the forces of Nadir Shah encountered the forces of Mughal Emperor and defeated Mughal Emperor's thoroughly. This was a decisive battle. And Nadir Shah took away the Kohinoor diamond from India and the jewel studded peacock throne of Shah Jahan. He claimed his supremacy on all the areas lying west of river in the or popularly, popularly known as trans in this area the attack of nadisha exposed the weaknesses of mughal empire for the succeeding invaders battle of karnal was fought between the nadisha and the mughal emperor shah in this on 13 feb 1739 muhammad shah was succeeded by the next mughal emperor ahmad shah whose reign was from the 1748 to 54 he came to power with the help of his general Imadul Mulk. Imadul Mulk name is important as he established the Berar dynasty. Ahmad Shah was a weak ruler. General Imadul Mulk so General Imadul Mulk blinded Ahmad Shah and made Alamgir II whose reign was 1754-58 the emperor. Soon he was also deposed by Imadul Mulk and replaced by Shah Alam II. Shah Alam II was ruled from 1758 to 1806 and who was succeeded by the Akbar II. Akbar II whose reign was from 1806 to 1834 gave the title Akbar II gave the title of Raja to Raja Ram Mohan Roy and asked him to go to Britain and plead for the net. He was replaced Akbar II was replaced by Bahadur Shah Zafar from 1834 to 1862 and during his reign the first battle of Indian independence of 1857 or revolt of 1857 was fought and the journey continues <music>
a Bengal regulation 21 of 1795, the practice was declared to constitute uh, to constitute murder, and the territory to which the regulation applied was extended in 1804. So, next important reform was suppression of thagi. Uh, the campaign for the suppression of thagi was one act of the government that aroused no public hostility because its practical its practical advantages were. plain to everybody the word thug was probably derived from the sanskrit word thagna to means to deceive and the men who were called thugs should more accurately be termed phasidar noose holders means because strangulation was the method they used for murdering their victim before robbing them right so britishers first noticed it from late 18th century but took action in 1829 bentick set up special department and william was placed in charge in 1835 during 1831 to 37 more than 3000 thugs were convicted the next reform was most important reform that is abolition of sati so among other abuses that offended the universal moral law was sati uh, the rights itself should properly be called sahmarna a uh, means accompany, accompanying in death uh, the practice was of long standing in india and the virtuous widow usually gave up her life by allowing herself to be burned to death on the funeral pyre of her husband generally the right was confined to high caste hindus muslim invaders found it particularly objectionable and the mughal emperor tried to discourage it although a number of individual british officials interfered at various times to prevent particular cases of sati uh, there was but no official policy so in the abolition of sati role of raja ram mohan roy was very important they took several steps to abolish sati and in 1803 belisley proposed to abolish it but it failed another time was 1812 officials were instructed to ensure that sati was voluntary when in 1828 william bentick arrived he was instructed to take steps to end the practice of sati gradually or immediately as a result 1st december 1829 sati was declared illegal by william bentick at behest of directors from ancient times it was common in higher varnas never prescribed by dharma shastra to common women so now we'll discuss the social reforms the two important components of social reforms during 19th and 20th century were emancipation of women and removal of caste rigidity and abolition of untouchability under the pressure of different social reformers in india the british authority enacted different legislations to improve the condition of women in india uh, the first such social reform legislation was then regulation 1829 which declared custom of sati illegal under the pressure of raja ram mohan roy regulation 5th of 1843 which declared practice of slavery as illegal regulation 15 of 1856 illegalized widows remarriage under the pressure of ishwar chandra vidyasagar in 1872 native marriage act was passed which fixed the minimum age of marriage for both boys and girls in india after this under the pressure of social reformers bm malabari the british authority enacted age of consent act 1891 which fixed the minimum age of 12 year for the marriage of any girl in 1930 sharda act was passed which fixed the minimum age for boys and girls for marriage as 18 and 14 respectively the child marriage restraint act 1978 fixed the minimum age for boys and girls as 21 year and 18 years respectively still valid in india as we know so if we talk about indian social religious movement uh, that is indian renaissance so it was bit different from the renaissance in europe renaissance basically means re revival or rebirth of classical 
सिविलाइजेशन स्टार्टिंग फ्रॉम लेट मिडिल एजेस दैट इज थर्टीन हंड्रेड फिफ्टीज इटालियन पेनिसुला एक्सपीरियंसड न्यू टाइप ऑफ इंटेलेक्चुअल मूवमेंट विच गॉट स्प्रेड फ्रॉम एंटायर वेस्टर्न यूरोप बाई सिक्सटीन सेंचुरी एंड कवर्ड एवरी एस्पेक्ट ऑफ ह्यूमन लाइफ लिटरेरी आर्टिस्टिक एंड सम साइंटिफिक ब्रेक थ्रूज वर पार्ट ऑफ द रेनेसा इट इज बेसिकली अ सेक्युलर मूवमेंट सो फ्रॉम सिक्सटीन सेंचुरी वेस्टर्न यूरोप गॉट अफेक्टेड फ्रॉम रिलीजियस मूवमेंट नोन एज रिफॉर्मेशन सो देर वर प्रोटेस्टेंट्स एंड कैथोलिक्स प्रोटेस्टेंट्स वर लिबरल माइंडेड पीपल रिवोल्टेड अगेंस्ट एग्रेसिव प्रैक्टिस ऑफ कैथोलिक चर्च under martin luther king etc initially church alienated by counter reformation but later as nature of aggression against church uh, gone up it went for reformation social reform was integrated with religious movements so indian renaissance has very different characteristics features that is the main feature was dualism dualism means one was transitional or traditional feature and the other thing was a culturative means modern but different from westernization the historic role of socio religious movement can only be understood within the context in which they originated and functioned uh, the further details of the socio religious movement will be discussing later so now here comes the uh, second important component of social reform that is caste movement so the reason behind the caste movement was first was education and then awareness comes with the education and another thing was sanskritization and indian renaissance these all were the uh, considered to be the reason behind during British this rule people from all classes got opportunity of education lower cl classes also studied so greater awareness uh, came with that grievances of the educated men of lower caste was the main reason also education and awareness enabled radical elements of lower caste to do away with the caste system if we talk about sanskritization people of lower caste after moving up the social ladder will start imitating the higher varnas and start discriminating lower people and in indian renesa it did not in able to curb the caste system nor to stop discrimination especially untouchability the first caste census under britishers was done in 1901 and the last was in 1931 and very recent we have seen the caste census census is done on, on the caste basis 2011 census so the first caste movement that emerged in south india was south indian liberation federation It started in 1917 by p tyagaraj c n mudaliar and t m nair uh, the organization was renamed after justice party in 1942 what happened this party came under the control of reformer known as cn anna durai and was popularly known as anna and uh, anna uh, renamed this party as dravid kazagam or dravidian federation in 1944 in 1949 uh, there was a split in this party and a faction under cn anna durai established another party which came to be known as dravid munnetra kazagam or dmk so next important movement in tamil nadu was self respect movement and that is by social reformer e ramaswami naikar popularly known as periyar so he demanded equal rights for untouchables in tamil nadu he was a fierce critic of mahatma gandhi as he was a fierce fierce critic of mahatma gandhi because gandhi always had in mind the objective of eradicating untouchability by root and branch but gandhi supported ancient classification of hindu society into four varnas for him varna system reflects dharm and the division of labor which is essential for the better functioning of a strong and moral society but what periyar thought in his opinion that in his op opinion untouchability can be abolished only after dismantling four fold division of society that is varna system a next important movement was started in state of kerala by sri narayan guru he belonged to ezavas community he started the sndp that is 
श्री नारायण धर्म परिपालन योगम इन 1902 टू एमिलेट द कंडीशन ऑफ अनटेचेबल्स इन द स्टेट ऑफ केरला श्री नारायण गुरु इन केरला लेड अ लाइफ लॉन्ग स्ट्रगल अगेंस्ट अपर कास्ट डोमिनेशन ही क्वाइन द स्लोगन वन रिलीजन वन कास्ट वन गॉड फॉर मैन काइंड विथ हिज डिसाइपल साधारण अयपन चेंज इन टू नो रिलीजन नो कास्ट एंड नो गॉड फॉर मैन काइंड सो वॉट अयपन नेम्ड इट नो रिलीजन नो कास्ट नो गॉड फॉर मैन काइंड इन साउथ मेनी इवेंट्स इंस्पायर्ड सेवरल सोशो रिलीजियस रिफॉर्म्स मूवमेंट इन द स्पेशली द टेम्पल एंट्री मूवमेंट टेम्पल एंट्री मूवमेंट सिग्निफिकेंट वर्क इन दिस डायरेक्शन हैड ऑलरेडी बीन डन बाई रिफॉर्मर्स एंड इंटेलेक्चुअल्स लाइक श्री नारायण गुरु एन कुमारन आसन फिर टी के माधवन एटसेट्रा सो इन नाइनटीन ट्वेंटी फोर वाइकुम सत्याग्रह लेड बाई के पी केसवा वॉज लॉन्च इन केरला ही डिमांडेड द थ्रोइंग ओपन ऑफ हिंदू टेम्पल्स एंड रोड्स टू द अनटचेबल द सत्याग्रह वॉज रीनफोर्स बाई जथाज फ्रॉम पंजाब एंड मदुरई गांधी अंडर टू का टूर ऑफ केरला इन सपोर्ट ऑफ द मूवमेंट एंड देन अगेन इन नाइनटीन थर्टी वन वॉट हैपन वेन द सिविल डिसोबीडियंस मूवमेंट वॉज सस्पेंडेड टेम्पल एंट्री मूवमेंट वॉज ऑर्गेनाइज इन केरला इंस्पायर्ड बाई के केलप्पन पोएट सुब्रमण्यम हु वॉज सिंगिंग सोड ऑफ केरला लेड अ ग्रुप ऑफ सिक्सटीन वॉलेंटियर्स टू गुरु वयूर अ सिमिलर स्टेप वॉज टेकन बाई सी राज गोपालाचारी एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन इन मद्रास इन नाइनटीन थर्टी एट सो नेक्स्ट इज नडार नडार इज अ तमिल कास्ट इट इज ऑल्सो रिफर्ड एज नडान शनार और ग्रामनी सो दे द नदार कम्युनिटी वॉज नॉट अ सिंगल कास्ट बट डेवलप्ड फ्रॉम अ असोटमेंट ऑफ रिलेटेड सब कास्ट विच इज विच इन कोर्स ऑफ टाइम केम अंडर द सिंगल बैनर नडार सो बेसिकली नडार मूवमेंट मूवमेंट वॉज बेस्ड ऑन तमिलनाडु सो नदार नडार ऑफ टूडे इज क्लेम टू बी क्षत्रिय स्टेटस एंड दे वेंट फॉर संस्कृटाइजेशन सो डिस contended with their social status a large number of nadal climbers embraced christianity and became upwardly mobile another movement in north tamil nadu was vaniyar movement vaniyars are, are also known as vaniya so the movement was based on basically of agricultural laborers pallis uh, called themselves vaniya kul kshatri means they claimed themselves as a vaniya kul kshatri and or they also followed sanskritization another movement was nay movement so uh, this movement was intermediate caste movement organized by cv raman pillai and uh, th- this movement was basically a peasant movement and he also means uh, pillai also wrote markand varma through which he evolved the military glory of nayars against social and political domination of nambardari brahmins and non malayali brahmins so now we will discuss the caste movement in western india so basically the jyotibab phule was the main leader in western india he established an organization known as satyashodhak samaj in 1874 so jyotibab phule belonged to the mali community and organized a powerful movement against the upper caste domination and brahmanical supremacy he founded satyashodhak samaj truth seeker society in 1734 with the leadership of the samaj coming from the backward classes malis telis kunbis the main aim of the movement were social service and spread of education among women and lower caste people phule's work sarvajanik satyagraha and gulamgir became source of inspiration for the common masses he highlighted the operation of untouchables at the hands of brahmins in through gulamgiri in 1875 phule used the symbol of raja bali as opposed for the brahmins symbol of ram phule aimed at the complete abolition of the caste system and social economic inequalities he was against sanskrit hinduism so the next movement was mahar movement so basically mahar is an untouchable caste cluster living chiefly in maharashtra and the, and its adjoining states so mahar movement brought the smaller and untouchable caste onto a single platform and also brought a degree of awareness 
and unity in enabling them to create a separate political party a system of education including schools and colleges hostels and an effective buddhist conversion movement we have already discussed that impact of british rule on indian society and culture was widely different from what india had known before uh, so in 18th century europe had experienced novel intellectual current and created the age of enlightenment so some english educated bengali youth known as derozio developed a revolution against hindu religion and culture gave up old religious ideas and traditional traditions and deliberately adopted practices most offensive to hindu sentiments such as drinking wine and eating beef more mature minds led by raja ram mohan roy were certainly stimulated by western ideas and western values but refuses to break away from hinduism uh, their approach was to reform hindu religion and society and they saw the path of process in an acceptance of the best of the east and the west so as we know a new spirit of rationalism and inquiry had given a new dynamism to european society the development of science and scientific outlook had affected every aspect of activity political military economic and even religious in contrast to europe which was an in the vanguard of civilization in the 18th century india presented the picture of a stagnant civilization and a static and decadent society thus uh, for the first time india encountered an invader who considered himself racially superior and culturally more advanced the new scientific outlook the doctrine of rationalism and humanism particularly impressed the english educated class so the indian leaders stimulated by the new knowledge sought to reform hinduism from within and sought to purge it of superstition superstitious beliefs and practices so uh, idolatry images image worship practice of pilgrimages came up for close scrutiny and consequent reforms the new concept of secularization was born the term secularization implies that what was previously regarded as religious was no longer regarded as such the magic wand was moved by rationalism that is the emergence of a tendency to regulate individual religious and, and social life in accordance with the principles of reason and to discard traditional beliefs and practices which cannot stand the test of modern knowledge this approach brought a great change in the concept of pollution and purity pollution means pollution of mind uh, so two categories of reform movements uh, fall in fall in there uh, first one was reformist movement like the brahma samaj the, the prarthana samaj and the aligarh movement and two revivalist movements like arya samaj ramakrishnan mission and devban movement both the reformist and revivalist movement depends on a varying degree on a on an appeal to the lost purity of the religion they sought to reform the only difference between one reform movement and the other lay in the degree to which it relied on tradition or on reason of consigns so uh, another significant aspect of all the reform movements was their emphasis on both religious and social reforms means in india social and religious reforms are integrated almost every social custom and institution in india derived sustenance from religious injunction and sanctions this means that no social reform could be undertaken unless the exist, uh, existing religious notion which sustained the social custom were also reformed and indian reformers well understood the close interrelation between different aspect of human activities ram mohan roy for example believed that religious reforms must precede demand for social reform or political rights 
so the religious movement is divided into two category first is traditional and another one is modern so we will discuss traditional and modern separately in traditional uh, we'll first talk about hindu religious movement and the most famous movement was dharma sabha uh, which was uh, started in calcutta in 1829 by radha khan dev so another, if we talk about muslims in muslims there were so many movements like i mean traditional movements like farazi or faridi movement in 1804 it started in east bengal and by haji shayatullah and sons dadu mia who organized a movement uh, whose aim was truth of islam but later turned into anti british another was wahabi movement which was started in between 1820 1870 in north india by sayyid ahmed brother sayyid ahmed means sayyid brothers another was darul uloom in 1806 it started in deoband which was in uttar pradesh and started by hussein ahmed mohammad qasim and rashid ahmed gangohi another was ahle hadith in late 19th century in punjab by sayyid nazir hussain uh, next uh, was ahle quran late 19th century it started in punjab by abdullah chakralavi if we talk about sikh movements uh, there were few important movements were first was nirankaris it is also very famous uh, today like in 1840 in punjab it, it was started by dayal das next was kuka movement kuka which is, is very famous movement in 1845 in punjab by jawahar mal another was namdar namdharis which was started in 1857 in punjab by ram singh in these movements uh, you just need to remember the chronology means year and the places leaders etc for the prelims so as we have discussed traditional now we will discuss the modern and in modern religious reforms we will discuss some important facts about hindu muslim movements and we'll discuss few more important and later on we'll discuss some important movements in detail so if we talk about in modern religious reforms uh, first is hindu reforms religious reforms and the famous one is atmiya sabha in 1815 it started in calcutta by raja ram mohan Roy. Another one was Brahma Samaj in 1828 in Calcutta by also by Raja Ram Mohan Roy. In Tattva Bodhini Sabha in 1839 in Calcutta by Devendranath Tagore. Mano Dharm Sabha in 1844 in Surat by Durga Durga Ram Mancharan. Another was Param Hans Mandali in 1849 in Bombay by Dadoba. pandu rang this is important you need to remember uh, another one was radha swami satsang in 1861 in agra by tulsi ram brahma samaj of india in 1866 in calcutta by keshav chandra sen prarthana samaj this is also very important in 1867 in bombay by dr atmaram pandurang so you need to remember these two pandurangs dadoba pandurang and atmaram pandurang another was arya samaj in 1875 in bombay by swami dayanand saraswati the next one is theosophical society in 1875 in new york by blavatsky and occult later in india another one was sadharan brahma samaj in 1878 in calcutta by anand mohan bose and shivanath shastri uh, so here we just need to remember few uh, branches of brahma samaj atmiya samaj brahma samaj of india because they all are derived from one another and uh, next one is deccan education society in 1884 in pune by g g agarkar insc means indian national social conference in 1887 in bombay by mg ranade dawa samaj in 1887 in lahore by shiv narayan agni hotri ram krishna math in 1887 and ram krishna mission in 1897 in baranagar and belur by swami vivekanand so you need to remember ram krishna math and ram krishna mission 
the difference between these two the years uh, as well uh, another one was servant of indian society in a1905 in bombay by gk gokhale another is puna seva sadhan in 1909 in pune by rambai rana day another one is social service league in 1911 in bombay by n m joshi aituc founder n m joshi was aituc founder next one is seva samiti in 1914 in allahabad it was started by h n kunjru in 1923 women's indian association in madras was formed by any besant in 1927 all india women conference was started by margaret cousins so next is muslim religious reform movement so first one is nadwaul ulama in 1894 in lucknow started by shibli nomani another one is barelvis in late 19th century in punjab it was started by ahmed raza khan next one is qadianis ahmadiyas in late 19th century in punjab by gulam ahmed next is anglo mohammedan education conference in 1818 1886 in aligarh started by sir sayed ahmed khan so in all these movement you just need to remember the places leaders and the year means especially the chronology so another uh, third one is six reforms so first one in six reform uh, was singh sabha in 1873 in amritsar it was started by thakur singh sadwalia and gyani gyan singh next one is singh sabha so these two sabhas are singh sabhas first one in 1773 and another one is 1879 firstly it was started in amritsar and second it was started in lahore and started by whom gurmukh singh and dit singh next one is akali dal in 1920 in amritsar by sarmukh singh in parsis we have will be seeing some movements like minochir rehnumai mazdayan sabha mazdayan sabha in 1851 in bombay by dada bhai noroji pardun ji and ss bengali next is roast uftar publication there uh, this was the publication by uh, mazdayan sabha roast uftar publication and another one is zen avesta religious book of parsis Hello friends welcome to our channel i teach today i'm going to discuss some important moments and personalities uh, as you all know that in our previous lectures we have discussed about these things shortly and today we will discuss some important ones so let's start this is raja ram mohan roy and brahm samaj you all know the form movement in india he started the movement to purify the doctrine of hindu religion but didn't criticized hinduism raja ram mohan roy propagated the idea of monotheism and hinduism in hindu religion so what he did he propagated the idea of monotheism and hinduism raja ram mohan roy published a work called a gift of monotheist in 1809 to propagate his idea of monotheism so his idea was in gift of gift to monotheist this work was written in persian original name was tofatul muwahidin tofatul muwahidin raja ram mohan roy established a group of followers under the banner of atmiya sabha in 1814 he discussed the religious doctrine atmiya sabha in 1814 to discuss the religious doctrine also apart from uh, raja ram mohan roy apart from this raja ram mohan roy also criticized some aspects of christianity he appreciated the new testament and content of testaments were praised and he praised he praised in his book percepts of jesus which was published in 1820 pioneer of political agitation in india he formed several smaller organizations to demand political and civil rights so this is important point you need to remember remember that he also formed several smaller organization 
for political and civil rights and also took help from foreign authorities raja ram mohan roy was also a pioneer of journalism like miratul akbar and banga datta these all were his publications raja ram mohan roy published his work in different languages as well like including persian sanskrit and urdu raja ram mohan roy was also a pioneer of modern education so you can say that he was the pioneer of political agitation journalism and modern education in india he also established vedanta college in 1825 these smaller things you need to remember that it may come in the examination so what was the purpose of establishing this college is to impart modern and scientific education he also gave active support to david hare to establish hindu college at Cal at calcutta in 1817 so hindu college was established in 1817 at calcutta apart from this raja ram mohan roy established brahm sabha in 1828 so so in 1814 atmiya sabha then in 1828 brahm sabha and it was renamed and converted into brahm samaj in 1829 so brahm sabha became brahm samaj in 1829 just to purify hindu doctrine from superstition okay raja ram mohan roy was also a pioneer of social reform movements in india he convinced the british authority to declare the custom of sati sati as you all know it was also it also involved minto hasting then raja ram mohan roy with bendik sati was actually declared illegal by enactment of regulation 17 of 1829 we have discussed it earlier in our previous lectures so as i said that uh, brahma sabha in august 1828 was established and in 1829 it was converted into brahma samaj so what was the samaj committed to the worship and adoration of the eternal unsearchable immutable being who is the author and preserver of the universe so basically raja ram mohan roy did not want to establish a new religion he only wanted to purify hinduism of the evil practices which had crept into it okay so roy's progressive ideas met with a strong opposition from orthodox elements like raja radha kan dev who organized the dharm sabha to counter brahm samaj so after the death of raja ram mohan roy in 1833 maharshi debendranath tagore father of rabindra tagore and a product of the best in traditional indian learning and western thoughts gave a new life to brahm samaj because after raja ram mohan roy's death there was a setback for the samaj's mission so he finally hold the command gradually the brahm samaj came to include prominent followers of raja ram mohan roy the derosians and independent thinkers such as ishwar chandra vidyasagar and ashwini kumar datta these two names you need to remember tagore worked on two fronts within his hinduism the brahm samaj was a reformist movement and outside it uh, it resolutely opposed the christian missionaries for their christianism of hinduism and their attempt at conversion the revitalized samaj supported widow remarriage women's education abolition of polygamy improvement in their rights and conditions and temperance got it so what we have seen till now that after raja ram mohan roy debendranath tagore came to give it a new energy and then derosians and then brahm samaj experienced another phase of energy vigorous and eloquence when keshab chandra sen was made the acharya by debendranath tagore soon after the former joined the samaj in 1858 keshab was instrumental in popularizing the movement and branches of samaj were opened outside bengal in the united provinces punjab bombay madras and other towns but unfortunately debendranath didn't didn't like some of sen's idea so ideas like uh, cosmopolitanization of samaj meeting by inclusion of teaching from all religions and his strong views against the caste system even open support to even open support to intercaste marriages keshab chandra sen was dismissed from the office of acharya in 1865 so keshab and his followers founded the brahm samaj of india in 1866 so this was another branch of brahm samaj means it's bifurcated from so keshab chandra sen was 
dismissed from the office of acharya in 1865 so in 1866 he founded brahm samaj of india and the another branch of it became the adi brahm samaj under the devendranath tagore so lately keshabs Keshav founded another renamed actually its uh, samaj as Keshav's Brahm Samaj because some of his disgusted followers made another branch Sadharan Brahm Samaj and why these followers are disgusted there were some reasons firstly that Keshav married his 13 year old daughter with Kuch Bihar's raja so the reason first reason was he married his minor daughter with the raja another reason was some of his followers considered him as an incarnation and another reason was that he became authoritarian according to some of his followers so these were few reasons of his followers to be discussed it follows if we talk about the overall contribution of brahm samaj we may be summed up like uh, it denounced the polytheism and idol worship it discarded this faith in divine avatars it discarded faith in divine avatars incarnations it denied that any scripture could enjoy the status of ultimate authority transcending human reason and conscience it took no definite stand on doctrine of karma and transmigration of soul so it took no definite stand on doctrine of karma and transmigration of soul and left it to individual brahmos to believe either way and the last one is it criticized the caste system so it's very important you need to remember all these okay so next is arya samaj dayanand saraswati and arya samaj so arya samaj was established by Mool Shankar, popularly known as Dayanand Saraswati. Dayanand Saraswati also gave the term Swaraj. Okay, you need to remember this as well. So this organization was established in 1875 at Bombay. In 1877, the headquarter of the this organization was shifted to Lahore from Bombay. Dayanand Saraswati gave the famous statement, which is "Go back to Vedas," by which he wanted that the followers of Hindu faith should. follow the original teachings as mentioned in the vedas and one more thing he also gave this term india for indians means two terms famous statements he gave go back to vedas and india for indians he was not in favor of practicing the vedic rituals practiced prescribed by the brahmins of vedic times this is very important means he was not in favor of practicing vedics and vedic ritual by brahmins of vedic times dhyanan saraswati appealed to the people to come back to the hindu faith through the shuddhi movement so he started also started shuddhi movement so if we talk talk about the contribution of arya samaj the members of arya samaj contributed to the spread of education in india the progressive member of arya samaj established chain of schools through india which which are known as dayanand anglo vedic school dav schools the conservative section of arya samaj established gurukul patshala at haridwar to give traditional education through the medium of sanskrit language so one was for modern education and another was for traditional education so next is ramkrishna mission so ramkrishna mission was established by swami vivekanand whose real name was narendranath dat so in 1897 he established ramkrishna mission at the place called belur swami vivekanand was a disciple of ramkrishna paramhans who believed that there are different paths to reach god and all these paths have one common feature that is service to mankind so what he believed so what he believed service to mankind so swami paramhans believed that service to mankind was service to god and anyone aspiring to reach god must serve the mankind swami vivekanand participated in world conference as religion in chicago in 1893 and his effective speech of 3 minute earned him the the title of modern monk of hindu faith the service of all beings means he believed that the service of jiva means living objects is the worship of shiva jiva is worship of shiva so now we will discuss wahabi movement means abdul wahab shah waliullah and 
Wahhabi movement. And from this, actually, this onwards, we will discuss some religious reform movement among Muslims. So, if you talk about this one, Wahhabi movement, uh, this movement was started in Saudi Arabia by Abdul Wahhab. This movement became popular in India during the first half of 18th century by Shah Waliullah. So, Shah Waliullah inspired this essentially revivalist response to western influences and the degeneration which had set in among Indian Muslims. He was the first Indian Muslim leader of 18th century to organize Muslims around the two-fold ideals of this movement. First was desirability of harmony among the four schools of Muslim jurisprudence which had divided the Indian Muslims and second was recognition of the role of individual conscience in religion where conflicting interpretation were derived from the Quran and the Hadith. The teachings of Waliullah were further popularized by Shah, Shah Abdul Aziz and Sayyid Ahmed Barelvi. This movement was against the British authority and it gave a serious challenge to the British establishment at different places. However, this movement was suppressed with brutal force by British authorities. So, this is all about this movement. So, now we will discuss Aligarh movement. So, the official view on the revolt of 1857 held the Muslim to be the main conspirators. So this view was further strengthened by activities of Wahhabi movement, right? But later what happened? An opinion got currency among the rulers that the Muslims could be used as allies against a rising tide of nationalist uh, political activities represented among others by the foundation of Indian National Congress. So, if we talk about Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, he was born in 1817 in respectable Muslim family and was a loyalist member of the judicial service of the government. So, after retirement in 1876, he became a member of Imperial Legislative Council in 1878. Got that? So, his loyalty earned him a a knighthood in 1888. So, he wanted to reconcile Western scientific education with the teachings of Quran, which were to be interpreted in the light of contemporary rationalism and science, even though he also held the Quran to be the ultimate authority. So, Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan started a movement and wanted to reconcile teaching of Islam as we have already discussed. So, he propagated his ideas through his journal, Tehzeeb al What was the name of the journal? Tehzeeb al Apart from this, Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan took several steps to promote modern education among the Muslims. He established Muhammadan Anglo-Oriental College at Aligarh in 1875. This college was converted into Aligarh Muslim University in 19. 19- 20. So, Aligarh Muslim University was earlier what? Mohammedan Anglo Oriental College. So, it aimed at spreading modern education among Indian Muslims to Islam without weakening the allegiance to Islam. And second, social reform among Muslims relating to parda, polygamy, widow, remarriage. So, these were all the social reforms. And another was women's education, slavery, divorce, etc. So, the ideology of the follower of the movement was based on the liberal interpretation of the Quran and they sought to harmonize Islam with modern liberal culture. And soon, Aligarh became the center of religious and cultural revival of the Muslim community. So, next movement is Devan movement. So, this movement was started by two religious reformers, Muhammad Qasim Nanotvi and Rashid Ahmed. Gangohi in 1866 in the modern district of Saharanpur, UP. This school promoted traditional learning but supported the national movement. So, now we will discuss the Sikh reform movements. So, the first religious reform movement among Sikhs religion was led by Singh Sabha formed in 1873 at Amritsar. Uh, The Singh Sabha movement had two fold objectives. First one is to make available modern western education to the Sikhs and and the second one is to counter the proselytizing activities of Christian missionaries as well as Hindu revivalists. For the first objective, a network of Khalsa school was established by the Sabha throughout the Punjab. The Akali movement was an 
ऑफ शूट ऑफ द सिंह सभा मूवमेंट ओके सो इट एम दैट लिबरेटिंग द सिख गुरुद्वारा फ्रॉम कंट्रोल ऑफ करप्ट उदासी महंस हु वर द लॉयलिस्ट एंड रिएक्शनरी अलॉट enjoying government patronages under the pressure of these leaders the british authorities were forced to enact a legislation known as shiromani gurudwara prabandhak committee act 1922 however this act was changed later and given a formal shape in 1925 and since then the management of gurudwaras throughout india is looked after by this committee so now we will read and the parsi reform movement so the rehnumai masdaisan sabha religious reform association also called known as religious reform association was founded in 1851 by a group of english educated parsi for the regeneration of the social uh, condition of the parsis and also restoration of the zoroastrian religion to its pristine purity this movement had uh, dada bhai noroji Nauroji Fardunji K R Kama and S S Bengali as its leader so they were the leaders of this movement Nauroji Dada Bhai Nauroji Nauroji Fardunji K R Kama and S S Bengali the message of reform was spread by the newspaper Roz Ghoftar Roz Ghoftar means truth teller Parsi religion rituals and practices were reformed and the parsi creed redefined in the social sphere attempts were made to uplift the status of parsi women through removal of the parda system so parda system was also there in the parsis and another was raising the age of marriage and education gradually uh, the parsis emerged as the most westernized section of the indian society later so we will now read about young bengal movement and henry vivian de rosio so this this one is also very important so during the late 1820s and early 1830s there emerged a radical intellectual trend among the youth of youth in bengal which came to be known as young bengal movement so this was the movement of radical intellectual youths of in bengal so a young anglo indian henry vivian de rosio who taught at the hindu college from 1826 to 1831 was the leader and the inspirer of this progressive trend drawing inspiration from the great french revolution de rosio inspired his pupil to think freely and rationally question all authority love liberty equality and freedom these call drawing inspiration from the great french revolution de rosio inspired his pupil to think freely and rationally question all authority love liberty equality and freedom and also oppose decadent customs and traditions so the de rosians also supported women's right and education also de rosio was perhaps the first nationalist poet of modern india so this may be a question so de rosians failed to have however a long term impact because de rosians were removed from hindu college in 1831 because of their radicalism and the main reason for their limited success was the prevailing social conditions at that time which were not ripe for the adoption of radical ideas because their ideas were so radical uh, later surendranath banerji was to describe the derosians as the pioneer of the modern civilization of bengal so the conscript fathers of our race whose virtues will excite veneration and whose failing will be treated with the gentlest consideration so we have already discussed about these last i mean mg rana day jyoti bab phule mg rana day founded indian social conference first session was held in madras 1887 and we all we have learned about jyoti bab phule as well satyashodhak samaj and periyar and narayan guru satyashodhak movement and mahar movement we have also studied about this in our previous lectures so now to sum up we will discuss positive and negative contributions of these reforms so if we talk about positive contributions these are liberation of individual from conformity out of fear psychosis worship made a more personal affair cultural roots to the middle classes mitigating the sense of humiliation much needed self respect gained actually and what 
it actually did this social reform movement this also did this also fostered secular outlook encouraged social climate for modernization also ended india's cultural intellectual isolation from rest of the world and evolution of national consciousness so these were some positive contributions of these reforms so if we talk about so if we talk about ne negative contributions so negative contributions are narrow social base these social reforms what they did they made the social base narrow indirectly encouraged mysticism over emphasis on religious philosophical aspect of culture while under emphasizing secular and moral aspects hindus confine their praises to ancient indian history and muslims to medieval history created a notion of two separate peoples and increased communal consciousness historical process of evolution of composite culture arrested to some extent so these were some negative and positive contributions of this social reforms so in the next lecture we will come with some next and interesting topics thank you Hello friends welcome to our channel i teach today's topic is revolt of 1857 which is very important for both prelims and mains the revolt of 1857 was a conscious beginning of independence struggle against the britishers the revolt began on 10th may 1857 at meerut as sepoy mutiny the revolt of 1857 broke out in northern and central part of india which gave a rude shock to british establishments in india the major factors that led to revolt of 1857 were political factors the feeling of subjugation at the hands of few foreigners made the indian regional rulers realized that it was indispensable to dismantle the british imperial structure from india as such the regional rulers of northern and central india revolted against british domination economic factors economic exploitation was the most important factor that prompted the indian rulers to revolt against the british authority social factors even though the british authority took some progressive social reforms they were not acceptable to the orthodox sections of the society and religious factors the christian missionaries tried to convert the religious large indian section into christianity this was unacceptable by almost all the sections of indian population since proselytization was not acceptable by any of the religious doctrines of india it led to social reactions against the british and finally the immediate factor the introduction of enfield rifle by the british became the immediate factor as the cartridges before being loaded into the rifle were to be bitten off by the mouth of sepoys these cartridges contained fats of cow and pig and as such it was realized it by the sepoys the british were bent upon destroying the religion so the sepoys became the first section to revolt against the british authority which marked the beginning of revolt of 1850 in the hands of general bakht khan and in kanpur the important leader was nana saheb but the actual command were who were ruling on behalf of him were tatya tope and azimullah and in lucknow our begum hazrat mahal who was begum of awadh was was being supported by ahmadullah and in ara kumar singh who was jam zamindar of jagdishpur and in jhansi our rani lakshmi bai the famous brave queen of queen of jhansi and in bareilly khan bahadur khan and finally in faizabad was under the control of maulvi ahmadullah these brave leaders were fighting against the combined fight against the britishers and this is a very good example of hindu muslim unity before the 1919 non cooperation movement now let's discuss about the some of the british officers who suppressed the revolt of 1857 in delhi the, it was suppressed by john nicholson in september 1857 bahadur shah was deported and his two sons were killed and he was deported to rangoon where he died there in 1862 and it was a sad fate for him because he couldn't be buried in the land of his forefathers and 
in Kanpur, it was finally occupied by the John Campbell or suppressed by it. Initially, the Tatya Tope occupied though and from the Havelock, but finally Campbell won. And in Lucknow, initially, the Nail Neil officer was died, British officers, and it occupied by Tatya Tope. But finally, by the coming of December, Campbell recaptured it. And in Ara, where our Chakdishpur Raj Zamidar Kumar Singh were, was there, the main leader, William Taylor and Ira Coote suppressed the revolt. And finally in Jhansi, Hook Rose was the main British officers who played a great role in recapturing the Jhansi. And though it was a brave effort, but finally they have to escape to Nepal, the Begum Awadh, Khan Bahadur Khan and Nana Sahib. And Tatya Tope, due to the betrayal of colleague, he was captured and hanged in Shivpuri MP. Now let's discuss about the nature of the revolt. The revolt of 1857 has been interpreted differently by different scholars. Different interpretation has been given because there are no official records of revolt of 1857. Revolt of 1857 was marked by extreme parochial sentiments. All the leaders were concerned to safeguard their personal interests. Revolt of 1857 was backward looking as it supported the medieval values and culture against the progressive modern values. The revolt of 1857 was not the first revolt as it was preceded by many previous revolts. For example, in 1795, for example, in 1795, first white mutiny at Vello took place. In 18606, during the time of George Barlow, second white mutiny take place. In February, in February 1857, 19 native infantry revolted and disbanded. In April, 34th native infantry, whose one of the leader was Mangal Pandey at Barakpur, revolted against his officer and he was executed on April 6. And in 4th April, 19 members of the 3rd native cavalry refused to use new cartridges that were made of cow or pig's fats. And on 9th May, they were sent to 10 years of imprisonment and finally on 10th May, revolt took place. These were the preceding revolts. So it was not the first revolt that took place where there were many revolts at different places. And finally, a new opinion was that it was feeling of nationalism was not there in India. As such, it cannot be termed as national movement. It was also not war of independence because the leaders, because the leaders did not had any clear vision what was to be done after dislodging the British authority. So let's discuss the factors of for failure of the revolt of 1857. The revolt of 1857 couldn't get support from the Indian intelligentsia as well as the Indian middle class plus educated class. As such, it was devoid of ideological support which led to ruthless suppression. In addition, it was supported by Gurkhas, Sikhs, Marathas and Rajputs. These people supported the Britishers. All leaders of the revolt of 1857 were fighting against the British authority in an uncoordinated manner. They were fighting in the uncoordinated manner whose effect was that which facilitated the British authority to defeat Indian powers one by one. And in Indian, the Indian sepoys were officered by British military generals whose effect was that who acted swiftly or British officers acted swiftly to suppress the revolt among the sepoys. The Indian leaders were fighting with conventional techniques against the most organized force of the world and it was found bound to get defeated by this organized. So this has ended our portion for the prelims and start. I want to add some points about some analysis points right about the significances of the revolt. It was an excellent example of Hindu Muslim unity and it left an in valuable impression on Indians and paved way for rise of nationalism. Further, British rule underwent a major transformation in its policies and it led to end of company's rule and beginning of crown rule. And what were the consequences of revolt? Board of directors were removed as we know in the administrative machinery and secretary of state for India created. Governor general also named as viceroy for princely India from now on. And further, change in attitude towards the princes by the Britishers. And slogan of reform is given by given up by Britishers. Change in military recruitment policy. Early, ra, earlier, what was there? Large recruits from Eastern India. And after the revolt, large recruitments from Bengal, Bombay, Madras, and army that remained immune from the revolt and they supported Britishers. Three units were created. 
and uh, which developed a myth of martial and martial race non martial races of india those who held british that maratha rajputana gorkha and sikh are called martial races and others are named as non martial nature and character of revolt of 1857 has two major theories or divided into two categories one is colonial theory that regard the revolt as sepoy mutiny and the, and the nationalist theory first war of national independence according to the colonial theory many previous muti, mutinies along with 1857 all were unjustified illegal acts of indiscipline caused by a few disgruntled and misguided elements according to the britishers but according to the nationalist theory by v d savarkar and others it considered revolt as first war of national independence after independence r c majumdar and others revised their views they felt that it cannot be called first war of independence i neither first nor war of independence and what's the current view current view is that it might have been sparked by sepoy mutiny but later it took popular character large involvement of people wherever the movement took place it gave a real shock to people. thank you all the best for your exams Hello everyone welcome to our channel i teach so how are you all as you all know that we have discussed so many topics of uh, modern india in our quick revision series uh, today as well we are going to start a very important topic of history as well as important for polity and that is constitutional history of india under british so as you know that uh, east india company came up as a trader but slowly they became a territorial power but in between many problems were also there like east india company's members started private trading started taking presents bribes and also exploitation could be seen there as well as uh, human rights movement were also going on in the britain so all these things forced british british parliament to came up with some acts to regulate the activities of east india company so finally they came up with different kind of acts like regulating act pits india act and so on so we are we, we will be discussing this one by one first act was regulating act of 1773 this act is of great importance because it was the first step taken by the british government to control and regulate the affairs of east india company in india so uh, the provisions of this act was uh, first the governor general post was created means governor of bengal was now designated as governor general of bengal so first governor general of bengal was governor general was lord warren hastings another provision was the executive council was created for assisting the governor general and this council had four members to assist the governor general another point was establishment of supreme court in india first time and the court was established in calcutta in 1774 and the first chief justice was eliza m f so so governor general post was created his executive council was there containing four members and governor general also got the power of casting vote casting vote means in case of equal votes in case of dividing opinion the governor general had the right to cast deciding vote so another provision was prohibition of presents and bribes it also prohibited servants of company from engaging in any private trades you remember this was also a major problem in those times another was court of director who were elected every year were supposed to be elected after every four year now every year to every four year so these were few provisions of act of 1773 that is regulating act of 1773 another act was pits india act in this act so to rectify the defects of regulating act of 73 british parliament passed this act and also uh, the act of 1781 was amended and then it act was pits india act so in pits india act number of governor generals council executive council members was reduced to 
earlier it was four remember uh, in regulating act the executive member were four and now it became three so what it shows it shows that the governor general is becoming more powerful another point was apart from board of directors a board of control that is president plus six member this is important president and six members in board of control was established in britain to look after the political affairs in east india company in india another was the bombay and madras presidencies were supposed to be looked after by bengal presidencies means these two presidencies madras and bombay came under the bengal presidency and another point was first time indian territory were called possession of british first time so it is important to remember that when it was known as called as possession of british in this act pips india act so and uh, the last point was separate commercial and political function means board of control what it shows it shows the separation of commercial and political function so here comes another charter act and that is 1813 charter act so in the charter act of 1813 the main point was monopoly of east india company was ended except the trade in tea and trade with china these two you have to remember the trade with tea and sea means tea and china except these two the monopoly of east india company was ended and another was first time one also rupees 1 lakh sanctioned by british parliament for the spread of education in india this was the first time when any money had had been sanctioned. another provision was companies recruits to be trained in uk and the last thing was official permission to the christian missionaries missionaries to spread the education so next was the charter act of 1833 so this act made the governor general of bengal as the governor general of india so first governor general of india was william bentick so the bombay and madras presidencies were subordinated to the bengal presidencies finally and the important feature was also this one all trading activities of east india company came to an end and including the trade with t and china earlier they have got these two things but now complete end of these all trading activities of east india company in this act a clause was inserted which declared that no one can be discriminated on the basis of religion race sex or place of birth in the matter of public appointment and employment so earlier it was a kind of discrimination like they can nominate anyone but now it it had come towards the transparency so in our constitution as well you can find this became from 3 to 4 members so in regulating act there were four members again in pits india act 3 and now in this act again the four members and the thing so tell me in the comment box below which article is that okay so next is uh, a law member was added in executive council of governor general and again it, another member was lord mekale so the first law member was lord mekale another feature was governor general in council was to make laws for all british india so this is becoming centralized in this act we can also see the first trace of drafting constitution and now all commercial activities they had ended so the from now on only administrative body the company had become an administrative body so in moving further we can see that in the charter act of 1853 under this act the law member lord macaulay became the full fledged member and now he could attend the meetings another scheme was uh, competitive examination was introduced for indian civil services recruitment and for the first time indians were associated four members members appointed so of these four members out of six from madras bombay bengal and agra local governments local or provincial government you can say so here as well separate legislative and executive functions we can see 
this act separated for the first time the legislative and executive function of governor general's council so these were few important points of this charter act so if you see from 1773 to 1853 these acts were more towards centralization right and now from now on you will see these all acts were more towards decentralization hello friends welcome to our channel i teach in our previous lecture we have discussed about the acts of constitutional history of india under british so uh, in today's lecture we will discuss the rest of the acts so if you see from 1773 to 1853 these acts were more towards centralization right and now from now on you will see these all acts were more towards decentralization uh, if we talk about the government of india act 1858 this act started the process of decentralization and why so because this act was enacted in the wake of revolt of 1857 so the act of it is also known as the act for the good government of india so th so this act abolished the east india company and transferred the power of government territories and revenue to the british crown so you can say that british crown became the formal head of the indian territories also in this act we will be uh, seeing that the post of governor general was abolished and in its place viceroys were appointed who acted as the direct representative of the british crown the court of directors and board of control were abolished and a secretary of state was appointed to look after the indian administration the secretary of uh, secretary was assisted by 15 members to look after the minute details of the indian administration also they had no intention of annexing indian states uh, that is doctrine of lapse abolished now indian council act of 1861 so after the great revolt of 1857 the british government felt the necessity of seeking the cooperation of indians in the administration of their country in 60 1861 we will see the following features like three acts were passed in 1861 indian council act indian judiciary act and indian executive act it made a beginning by associating indians in law making process viceroy should nominate some indians as non official members earlier as well we have seen that it was non official members of his expanded council in 1862 what happened lord canning nominated raja of benares maharaja of patiala and sir Din dinkar rao as a non official members of his expanded council it initiated the process of decentralization by restoring the legislative power of bombay and madras presidencies we have seen earlier that before 1853 we will see the administration and acts more towards centralization and now we are seeing the decentralization that is it reverse the centralizing tendency that started from 1773 and reached at its climax in 1833 another was establishment of new legislative council for bengal north west frontier province and punjab moreover recognition of the recognition to portfolio system by canning in 1859 under this a member of the viceroy's council was made in charge of one or more departments of the government and was authorized to issue final orders and behalf of the council on matters of his departments a further empowered the viceroy to issue ordinances without the concurrence of the legislative council during an emergency uh, the life of such an ordinance was 6 months let's move to the council act of 1890 Council Act of 1892 increased the number of additional non-official members in the central and 
provincial legislative council but maintained the official majority also it provided for the nomination of some non official member of the central legislative council by voice rai and on the recommendation of provincial legislative council and bengal chamber of commerce and in provinces by the governor on the recommendation of district board municipalities universities trade associations and zamindars and chambers like today we see that uh, in center president does that and in states governor further it increased the function of legislative council and gave them the power of discussing the budget and ad addressing question to the executive and moreover the act made a limited and indirect provision for the use of election in filling up some of the seats and that to non official in the central and provincial legislative council one more thing here will have to remember that the word election was not used in the act the process was described as nomination made on the recommendation of certain bodies uh, indian council act of 1909 this act is also known as morley minto morley minto reforms uh, morley was secretary of state for india and minto was viceroy of india under this method method of direct election was introduced to appoint the member of provincial council the member of council were given right to vote earlier what they have got only right to discussion and now they have they had got right to vote on separate budget items A system of separate electorate was also introduced for the first time for muslims giving this separate electorate to muslims actually legalized communalism and that's why lord minto came to be known as father of communal electorate and as you all know this is unfortunately led to the partition of india further uh, this act increased the size of legislative council both in provincial and central in central legislative council the member raised to 64 from 16 but in provinces this was not uniform it also retained official majority in the central legislative council but allowed non official majority in provincial legislative council now members were allowed to ask supplementary questions they move resolutions that is this act enlarged the function of legislative council at both the levels moreover uh, this act for the first time provided association of indians with the executive council of viceroy and governors in 1917 the british government declared for the first time actually that its objective was the gradual introduction of responsible government in india uh, the government of india act of 1919 was that's why enacted and this act is also known as montagu james ford act so montagu was secretary of state and james ford was viceroy of india this act introduced for the first time bicameralism and direct election in the country so this may be a question the central legislature was made bicameral of council of states and house of assembly further it relaxed the central control by demarcating the separating of the central and provincial also for the first time it separated the provincial budget from the central budget Moreover the central and provincial legislatures were authorized to make laws on their respective list of, list of subjects however structure of government continued to be centralized and unitary the principle of diarchy was introduced in the provinces whereby the legislative subjects were divided into two groups reserve subjects and transfer subjects so here you uh, have to remember that this diarchy is different from bicameralism bicameralism is what upper house and lower house and diarchy is what diarchy is the dual scheme of governance though this dual scheme was largely unsuccessful now as we have said here that their subjects were, were reserve subjects and transfer subjects so reserve subject were under the control of governor general and his executive council and the transfer subjects were under 
control of popularly elected ministers moreover this act required the three out of six members of viceroy executive council were to be indian other than the commander in chief so what we are seeing here that the association of indians are increasing earlier we have seen that only satyendra sinha was there and now three indians are here also it extended the principle communal representation by providing separate electorates for six indian christians anglo indians and europeans so what we have seen that in 1909 for the first time separate electorate was given to muslims and now to to the six indians and anglo indians and europeans also granted franchise that is right to vote to a limited number of people on the basis of property tax and education further it created a new office of high commissioner for india in london and transferred some of the functions performed by the secretary of state for india it also provided for the establishment of public service commission hence a central public commission was set up in 1926 for recruiting the civil servant it provided for a statutory commission to inquire into a inquire into and report on its working after 10 years of its coming into force as a result simon commission came after 10 year that is on in 1927 which was due on 1929 Nine Government of India Act 1935 marked a second milestone towards a complete responsible government in India. It provides provision of Indian Federation of Provinces and princely states as a unit was announced. The Act also divided the power between centre and units into three lists: federal list, provincial list, and concurrent list. Like today, we have. state list center list and concurrent list so but it never came into operation as requirement was 50% of princely states should give consent and they never gave provincial autonomy was also ensured it further extended the communal representation by providing communal electorates for depressed class and women and labor earlier we have seen that in 1909 communal award was given to muslims for the first time 19 19 this was extended to six indian christians europeans and anglo indians and now it also extended to depressed classes women and labor further it abolished diarchy in the provinces but introduced responsible government in the pro- province that is governor was required to act with advice of ministers responsible to provincial legislature this came into effect in 1937 and was discontinued in 1939 also it provided diarchy at the center means federal subjects divided into reserve subjects and transfer subjects and further it introduced bicameralism in 6 out of 11 provinces bengal bombay madras bihar assam and united provinces so what we are seeing here that in 1919 act diarchy was introduced in the provinces but was abolished in 1935 act in the provinces and diarchy was introduced in the very same year at the center and if we talk about bicameralism bicameralism introduced at the center in 1919 act and was uh, introduced in the provinces in 1935 act further abolished the council of india established by the government of india act 1858 further it extended franchise means right to vote 10% of total population got the voting rights earlier only tax payers and property who had got property they only have the right to vote moreover it provided for the establishment of a reserve bank of india to control the currency and credit of the country it also provided for the establishment of not only a federal public service commission but also a provincial public service commission what we have seen that in 1926 public service commission provision was introduced and today the joint public service commission federal public service commission was also 
introduced furthermore it provided for the establishment of a federal court which was set up in 1937 so the last act is indian independence act of 1947 actually on february 20 1947 the british prime minister clement attlee declared that the british rule in india would end by june 30th 1948 and after which the power would be transferred to responsible indian hands so basically this independence act of 1947 came to give effect to the mount betten plan this act ended the british rule in india and declared india as a as an independent sovereign state from august 15 1947 it also provided for the partition of india and creation of two independent dominion of india and and these two dominion was india and pakistan with the right to secede from british common wealth also it abolished the office of viceroy and provided for each dominion a governor general who was to be appointed by the british king on the advice of dominion cabinet further it empowers the constituent assembly of the two dominion to frame and adopt any constitution and to repeal any act of british parliament and legislate for their respective territories till the new constitution drafted and enforced moreover it abolished office of the secretary of the state for india and transferred his function to the secretary of the state for commonwealth affairs it also granted the freedom to princely states either to join the dominion of india or dominion of pakistan or to remain independent so as we all know at the midnight of 1415 to august 1947 the british rule came to an end and power was transferred to the two new independent dominion of india and pakistan lord mountbatten became the first governor general of new dominion of india and he sworn in jawahar lal nehru as the first prime minister of independent india hello friends welcome to our channel i teach so today we will discuss about maratha peshwas but before discussing peshwas we will shortly discuss the history of shivaji i mean ancestral history of shivaji and his descendants so shivaji bhosle first first because you will know about it later Shivaji Bhosle first was an Indian warrior king and a member of Bhosle Maratha clan and his father was Shah ji who was the son of Malo ji and Malo ji was the military commander in Nizam Shahi Sultan of Ahmednagar Shivaji had two sons Shambha ji and Raja Ram Shambha ji ruled between 1680 to 89 his son was Shaho ji and raja ram ruled after the death of shambha ji between 1689 to 1707 shahu ji who was the son of shambha ji was arrested by aurangzeb and he was released later by bahadur shah first in 1707 so here in 1707 he was released i mean shahu ji was released and tara bai and his son was ruling in 1707 at kolhapur jagir shivaji means shivaji 2 son of raja ram and tara bai was the wife of raja ram and by this time the real power shifted towards peshwas and they means chhatrapatis were only the nominated head of the marathas so the real power was in the hands of peshwas and chhatrapatis were the nominal head if we talk about maratha empire so maratha empire was carved out by shivaji from the declining adil shahi sultanate of bijapur that formed the genesis of maratha empire so peshwa was a prime minister of maratha empire of indian subcontinent and originally peshwa word was derived from a farsi word so peshwa is basically a farsi word means prime minister originally the peshwa served as 
subordinates to the Chhatrapati. But later they became the leaders of Maratha Confederacy, as we have discussed earlier. So during last year of the Maratha Empire, the Peshwa themselves were reduced to titular leaders and remained under the authority of Maratha nobles and British East India Company. The first Peshwa was Moropan Pingle, who was appointed as the head of Ashta Pradhan by Chhatrapati Shivaji. And Ashta Pradhan was the council of eight ministers. And under Chitpavan Brahmin Bhatt family, the Peshwas became the de facto hereditary administrator of the confederacy. So, first in this list was Balaji Vishwanath in 1713 to 1720. He was the Sena Kriti. He also helped Sayyid brothers in killing. Farukh Seer. During 1720 to 1714, the Peshwa was Baji Rao first. So he was the greatest proponent of guerrilla warfare after Shivaji. He also assumed the title of Hindu Patpat Shahi. He captured Salsit and Basin in 1733 from Portuguese and Gujarat Malwa and Bundelkhand. He also conducted Delhi raid in 1713 and he died in 1740. So Peshwa's office was most powerful under Bajirao first means during 1720 to 1740. So next Peshwa was Balaji Bajirao and he ruled between 1740 to 1761. So Maratha territories reached at its summit pinnacle or zenith during his rule. He consolidated his hold over the territories annexed by Bajirao first. Balaji Bajirao also faced the attack of Ahmad Shah Abdali. Ahmad Shah Abdali was the successor of Nadir Shah. So from 1748 to 1767, Ahmad Shah Abdali invaded India five times. In 1761, the forces of Ahmad Shah Abdali encountered the Maratha forces at the third battle of Panipat. Peshwa Balaji Bajirao organized the force under the nominal command of his son Vishwasrao and the actual command of the Maratha forces were under the Sadashiv Rao Bhau. Sadashiv Rao Bhau was his cousin. In the battle of Panipat, Maratha forces were thoroughly defeated by the forces of Ahmad Shah Abdali and both Vishwasrao and Sadashiv Rao Bhau were killed in this battle. And this was a big blow to Balaji Rao and he died of shock. And after his death, disintegration of Maratha empire had started. Balaji Baji Rao was succeeded by Madhav Rao. From 1761 to 1772, Madhav Rao was the Maratha Peshwa. And his only achievement was he brought back Mughal Emperor Shah Alam II from British captivity. He was in Allahabad and he brought him back to Delhi. After the death of Madhav Rao, the nobles started playing the role of kingmakers and was of succession between and war of succession between Narayan Rao. Narayan Rao was the son of Madhav Rao, minor son of Madhav Rao, and Raghunath Rao. Raghunath Rao was brother of Baji Rao. So war of succession started between these two. But Narayan Rao died soon and Madhav Rao was succeeded by Savai Madhav Rao. So from 1772 to 1795, Savai Madhav Rao was the Maratha Peshwa. And during his reign, some important treaties were Treaty of Surat in 1775. In this treaty, Salsit and Basin. Britishers got Salsit and Basin and Treaty of Purandar in 1776 and also First Anglo-Maratha War happened in his period. From 1775 to 1782, the First Anglo-Maratha War was a drawn struggle between Marathas and English. Both sides had a taste of each other's strength and this war came to an end by the Treaty of Salbai in 1782. This treaty had some provisions like that there could be no war between them for a period of coming 20 years. Means it was a friendship treaty. 
it provided a truce for 20 years and after this war five maratha houses emerged peshwas in pune gaikwad baroda bhosles of nagpur holkars in indore sindhias in gwalior this also facilitated actually british to follow divide and rule policy because there were so many groups of marathas and uh, britishers defeated these kingdoms one by one after 20 years of first anglo maratha war the second anglo maratha war was fought from 1803 to 1805 and in the second encounter maratha forces was defeated again by british east india company and most of their territories were annexed by british authorities and second anglo maratha war came to an end by signing of the treaty of rajpur ghat in 1805 so the love for freedom was still there in maratha sardars and was a chance to revolt so third anglo maratha war happened in 1817 and it came to an end in 1818 lord hastings was the governor general during third anglo maratha war the british out defeated marathas rulers and the post of peshwa ship was abolished and maratha were treated as normal kings so during the third anglo maratha war peshwa ship was abolished so this was all about marathas peshwas you need to know for your preliminary examination हेलो एवरीवन हाउ आर यू ऑल कैसे हैं आप सब आई होप आपको हमारे लेक्चर्स पसंद आ रहे हैं तो आज हम एक और इंटरेस्टिंग टॉपिक पढ़ने वाले हैं और वो है एनेक्सेशन ऑफ बेंगाल सो इंग्लिश ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी विच केम टू इंडिया एज अ ट्रेडिंग कंपनी वांटेड एक्सेस टू द प्रोविंस ऑफ बेंगाल बिकॉज इट वॉज द मोस्ट सक्सेसफुल इंडस्ट्रियल रीजन इन इंडिया द ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी ओपन अ पोर्ट इन कैलकटा एंड बाई द मिड सेवेंटीन the european military strength of great britain and france surpassed the mughal empire that ruled bengal so basically the separate province of bengal came into prominence under murshid kuli khan in 1717 and he ruled till 1727 he brought about the radical administrative reforms in bengal to establish himself as an effective ruler he was succeeded by shujauddin in 1727 which was the nawab of bengal till 1739 and shujauddin was succeeded by in 1727 shujauddin became the nawab of bengal he married to the daughter of murshid kuli khan and he was also a brave and liberal and generous person shujauddin became nawab after the death of his father in law murshid kuli khan and shujauddin was succeeded by sarfaraz khan in 1739 sarfaraz khan was assassinated by ali wardi khan in 1740 and ali wardi khan became the nawab of bengal in 1714 and he ruled till 1700 56 actually ali wardi khan was defeated by maratha peshwa in 1751 and he had to cede the province of orissa to the maratha peshwa the then peshwa balaji bajirao in the year of 1756 sirajud daula became the nawab of bengal when he became nawab he was a ruler totally against british east india company the new nawab sirajud daula challenged the increasing power of british to consolidate its position the british built what fort william in calcutta so this further infuriated sirajud daula and he attacked the fort and won soon after what happened robert clive was asked to take charge of the company and on june 23rd 1757 in the battle of plassey clive cleverly ousted sirajud daula sirajud daula and defeated the french ally of nawab signed a pact with the defeated army and killed the nawab 
So finally, in the Battle of Pallasi, Sirajud Dola and his allies were defeated by British. But Sirajud Dola actually defeated due to the betrayal of the top officials. Only two officers fought on behalf of Sirajud Dola, and they were Mir Madan and Mohan Lal. After the Battle of Pallasi, an agreement was followed. and the terms of agreement were first was the british east india company got the zamindari rights over bihar bengal and odisha and also they got zamindari rights over 24 parganas in bengal and moreover it was understood that the private traders of the east india company were not supposed to pay any tax on trade In 1757 Mir Jafar became the nawab of Bengal. Mir Jafar actually supported the Britishers against the Sirajud Daula. So he was a puppet of British East India Company. But gradually it was realized by Mir Jafar that it was not possible to satisfy British officials in India. Therefore he started doing what showing reluctance. So he was replaced by Mir Qasim in 1760 by the British officials and he transferred the capital of province of Bengal from Murshidabad to Munger means Mir Qasim transferred the capital of Bengal so it is very important and another was Mir Qasim gave some district of Bengal to British authorities in lieu of their support these districts were Bardwan Midnapur and Chatgaon but he i mean Mir Qasim opposed privileges to traders and wanted to give equal privileges to indian traders that is why he abolished custom duty on the goods of bengal to bring parity but mir qasim was dethroned by british authorities and mir jafar was again made nawab of bengal in 1763 but he ruled only for 2 years and meanwhile mir qasim joined hands with shah alam to the later mughal emperor and nawab shujaud daula of awadh the three power collectively forced the british authority at the battle of baksar so on october 23 1764 the battle of baksar started but the british won and mir qasim fled as did shah alam to shujaud daula fought for another few months before he too fled losing miserably Meanwhile Mir Jafar was dethroned in 1765 and Najmuddaula was made the nawab of Bengal and he was the last nawab of Bengal he, and he ruled from 1765 to 1772 so as always britishers also made an agreement and the terms of agreement after the battle of baksar between british and shah alam 2 was first was shah alam 2 the late mughal emperor gave the diwani rights or right to collect the revenue and to look after the civil administration of bengal bihar and odisha and as we have studied earlier that zamindari rights were given after the battle of plassey and now the diwani rights after the battle of baksar so they have got now what both the diwani and zamindari rights british authorities signed an important agreement with najmuddaula as well who was installed as the nawab of bengal with british support in 1765 so this agreement envisaged right of appointing or nominating a deputy subedar in bengal who was to look after the criminal administration of bengal this agreement in bengal is known as dual government in bengal but this dual government is actually different from double government that was in pitts india act double government means board of control and court of directors this was double government but this was abolished in the act of 1858 act so this agreement of bengal is dual government in bengal and that was double government the british authority also got the right of civil administration as well as the criminal administration in province of bengal through separate agreements 
This arrangement of administrative machinery is known as dual government of Bengal. Continued from 1765 to 1772. So this system of administration facilitated the British authority to subjugate the province of Bengal and to exploit the rich resources of the most prosperous province. So the British authority after the victory over the province of Bengal started to use the wealth generated from bengal to purchase the products for the purpose of selling in european markets this led to drain of wealth from india to britain for which india didn't received any material award this machinery of drain of wealth was first recognized by whom dada bhai nauroji who is also known as the first economic thinker so first economic thinker was dada bhai nauroji and the quantification of drain of wealth was first attempted by ramesh chandra dat in his work economic history of india one more thing it's very important for you to know that the treaty which was made after the battle of baksar is also known as allahabad treaty which was signed on August 16 1765 by Lord Robert Robert Clive and Mughal Emperor Shah Alam II the annexation of Bengal was first step to establishing a strong foothold in India and after annexing Bengal the britishers actually made their presence very strong so this was all for today thank you Hello everyone welcome to our channel i teach today i am going to discuss annexation of punjab the state of punjab was organized on effective lines by maharaja ranjit singh who belonged to a sukhar chakia misl he was a strong military commander and he built a strong military or army which was considered to be the second best army in asia after the british east india company he also took support of british in forming that army and in 1809 when ranjit singh attempted to establish his authorities on the territories of the east of the river indus then the conflict arose between the britishers and maharaja ranjit singh he was prohibited by the british authorities finally a friendship treaty was signed between maharaja ranjit singh and britishers in 1809 at amritsar and at that time governor general was lord minto first what were the features of this treaty both parties agreed to respect each other's territorial integrity and there was going to be a mutual peace between them for a period of 20 years for the 20 years everyone will respect their mutual domains and finally in when the ranjit singh died in 1839 at that time governor general was lord auckland so a crisis came in the punjab empire where he was succeeded by three to four minor rulers whose name were khadak singh nonihal singh sher singh and dalip singh these were all minor rulers so problem of crisis of the rulers was there since dalip singh was a minor ruler her mother started to rule on behalf of him her name was rani jindan and she was getting support from lal singh and tej singh lal singh was commander general as such british authority attacked punjab in 1845 and which marked the beginning of first anglo sikh war in 1845 at that time our governor general was lord harding in this war the sikh army was thoroughly defeated due to the betrayal of higher officials and a very large part of punjab province was annexed the first anglo sikh war came to an end by the signing of the treaty of lahore what is the name of the treaty lahore and the year is very important that is 1846 large part of punjab province was annex and the sikh army was thoroughly defeated due to the betrayal of higher officials and the sense of freedom was still left in the sikh rulers and the revolt of mool raj 
that began in 1848 provided an opportunity to british authority to launch final attack on punjab in the second anglo sikh war this marked the beginning of second anglo sikh war and the year was 1848 and in the second anglo sikh war the sikh armies were thoroughly defeated and the last independent state of india that is punjab was annexed in 1848 and the governor general was at that time was lord dalhousie and the important treaty was signed between the sikh rulers and the britishers that was the treaty of barowal the next time formation i want to give you here is the doctrine of last theory that was started by lord dalhousie according to it the pro imperial it was a basically a pro imperialist approach to expand the realm of british kingdom in india it was introduced by dalhousie who was the governor general it was used by him to annex the independent indian states it was basically an idea to annex those states which have no hair means the state have no hair they get less the right of ruling and it will not reverted by adoption the states were annexed by dalhousie by applying doctrine of lapse and chronological order in which indian states signed the doctrine of lapse or fell prey to it for the states of satara in the year 1848 jaipur in 1849 and in sambalpur in 1849 in the same year bahat in 1858 udaipur 1852 jhansi 1853 and nagpur was 1854 and finally in avadh was came into india under the mal administration for mal administration avadh was annexed and the whole india was under the british rule and they marked the another journey of britishers started from here so having acquired the vast empire of india the british authority started to organize as an efficient administrative machinery for the systematic exploitation of indian resources so the british administration in india was based on three pillars and these three pillars of british administration were known as the civil service the police and army and what were the main features first of all the british from the very offset excluded the indians from higher civil services and the logic that was given was what was the logic given was to act to exploit the indian resources without indian interference in course of time the civil services became the steel steel frame of british administration if the question is asked which organ of the british state was known as the steel frame of british administration that was indian civil service in 1800 a college was established by lord wellesley at calcutta in fort william to provide training what was the purpose training of new recruits to civil services and however this was not approved by the british authority this is important this was not approved by the british authority in britain and they established another college in britain in 1806 and what was the name of that haliberry in britain it's also very important and further a clause was inserted which indicated that there would be no discrimination it was a landmark act because earlier these were the recruits were only nominated and indians has very less participation in that so first time it was mentioned that there will be no discrimination on the basis of caste religion sex race or place of birth and further in the charter act of 1853 it there came as one more provision that the members of the indian civil services would be selected not through the nomination but through competitive examination so from here the competitive examination of the civil service aspirant started and is still continuing till present second main organ or the main arm or we can say pillar of the 
British administration was the police. The system of police was created in India by Lord Cornwallis. He created the police stations at different places to maintain law and order. And further, the Indian Police Act, which came in 1861, which provided the guidelines, which provided the guidelines for functioning the police system in India. It continued or it was operational in India till recently in 2007 when it was amended in 2007 on the recommendation of Soli Sorabji Committee. What is the name of Soli Sorabji Committee? And who was Soli Sorabji? He was former Attorney General of India. Further moving, then the next pillars of British administration was the army. Army under the British rule served various purposes. It facilitated, it facilitated the Britishers to defeat the Indian powers. Further, it protected the nascent British Empire in India from foreign attacks. Further, it was instrumental in suppressing the internal revolts, suppressing the Indian revolts. And in the lastly, it helped the British authority to maintain the perfect law and order. In the lower levels of the army, Indians were appointed to serve the British imperial interest. And the Indians who were appointed only at the lower levels of, levels of the British army were known as the Indian sepoys. What, what were they known as? Indian sepoys. Apart from these three pillars, they all, British authority also established an elaborate judicial system in India. And the first step was taken by Warren Hosting, who was the Governor General from 1772 to 1775. First step was taken by him, who established district courts at various district levels. However, Lord Cornwallis established an elaborate hierarchy of courts in India and for the first time he separated revenue administration from the judicial administration so the cornwallis established the munsif court at the lowest levels the cases under jurisdiction of munsif courts were minor in nature munsif courts were presided by the indian judges these cases could be tried these cases could be tried of the nature of which has disputes up to rupees 50. Next came the after Munsif Registrar Court. They were presided by the British judges and here in Munsif Court they were presided by the Indian judges. Cases were up to the rupees 100. Further, there were ever Registrar Court, there were district courts. They were also presided by the British judges and cases of the nature of 2 rupees 150 were dealt here. Above all these, there were four provincial courts were established at Calcutta, Murshidabad, Dhaka and Patna. This is very important. You write the names of these and learn them. There were provincial courts. And above all, the civil cases could be tried by four, four provincial courts of appeal, whereas criminal courts could be tried by four provincial courts of circuit. And the, above them were Sardar Diwani Adalat, highest court of highest court of appeal highest court of appeal in civil cases civil cases and correspondingly sardar nizamat was the highest court of appeal in criminal cases but in this hierarchy an, an important change was made by william banting who was governor general and first governor general of bengal in 1831 what he did, he abolished four provincial courts of appeal and four provincial courts of circuit in 1831. In place of these, he established what he established commissionaries headed by commissioner. Further, in 1865, high courts were established in the presidential towns of Calcutta, Bombay, and Madras. And M1 XM formation for you guys is in 1860 Civil Procedure Act was passed and in 1913 Criminal Procedure 
act was passed thank you hello everyone welcome to our channel i teach this is going our quick revision series of modern india and in the previous lectures we have covered several topics like advent of the europeans then decline of the moguls and something about marathas then we talked about carnatic wars mysore punjab annexation of bengal then further moved and talked about revolt of 1857 and now in this lecture i will cover an important topic that's economic policies of british economic policies of british in this there are several topics which includes agriculture policies or industrial policies or trade and tariff policies but in this very chapter i will try to focus on the agriculture policies as we know that the ideologies and philosophies play a great role in the policies of the government in the same way british administration we can see the economic policies has certain impacts of philosophies and ideologies for example in 1215 king john granted few rights to feudal lords that was magna carta and the two main principles developed that's no taxation without the consent of people and no one can be denied individual liberty and one cannot be arrested without giving out valid reason around 16th century the middle class demanded concessions but the rights were extended to common men only in 19th century women rights extended in england only in 1920s development of parliamentary form of government negotiations between the crown and middle class basically based on the principle of liberalism the theory of liberalism was founded or developed by john locke and it remained essence of the british polity for about 200 years he talked about the civil society according to him civil society to be granted to certain basic rights right to rule of law government to be laid down certain rights to the common man right to equality before law it was implemented in britain in due course of time by late 1819th century england's first phase to be affected by industrial revolution and vast changes in socio economic political and demographics therefore the three offshoots of liberalism emerged one was laissez fairism or free trade policy developed by adam smith classical economic theory which was given by malthus and ricardo another offshoot branch of liberalism was utilitarianism or benthianism which is based on the principle maximum happiness to maximum number of people and the third offshoot was evangelicalism related to religion William Wilberforce main spokesperson in British parliament Charles Grant influenced policies of Christian missionaries in India so the impact of these three can be seen in various economic policies or other social policies of britishers from time to time for example laissez fairism the principle of laissez fairism could be seen in the third phase of britishers economic policy that is one way free trade which is visible in mercantilism state influence or intervention in economy of the state no monopoly of few in initial phase of industrial revolution the middle class believed in open market competition thus mercantilism sidelined by laissez fairism mercantilism was in the second phase of economic policies of british in which direct plunder took place which is based on the doctrine of state intervention in the economic life of the people as the monopoly of trade was already established through military and political control that subsidiary alliance treaty which was signed by the different princely states according to the wellesley who was the governor general utilitarianism was based on the idea of utility every step of the state should oversee the impact of the people act should be to bring happiness to maximum population here it is believed that state should play a proactive role and evangelism for the spread of christianity apart from profit spread of christianity was another motive of britishers the britishers were very cautious in their support for missionaries so if we see that there the phases of economic policies could be divided into three first phase is from 1600 to 1757 in which they came as a trading corporation or traders in the second phase is mercantilism as i have already explained this theory and it's visible in economic policies of the british this phase was the direct plunder huge exploitation and wealth was taken from the india to the britain 
in the third phase this was a phase of one way free trade and it was based on the principle of laissez fairism free trade policy and in 1862 1947 financial imperialism could be seen in the economic policies of the britishers in 1900 to 1947 india became financial capital as i have talked or said that in this lecture i will deal with the land revenue system or agriculture policies so land revenue system there were three main land revenue systems which were developed by the britishers in different region first was the permanent settlement that was applied by the lord cornwallis in the year 1793 and it was applicable to the provinces of bengal bihar and orissa in its settlement accounted for 19 percent of the total cultivable area and its important features were it created the class of new landlords or zamidars who were very exploitative nature of the peasants and they revolted in the 1857 against the britishers and they were the middlemen for collecting the revenue in between the peasants and the britishers and apart from this 89 percent of the total land revenue to the state and the remaining 11 percent were kept with the zamidar for his expenses this was known as sunset clause as the revenue has to be given to the britishers on a fixed date the next important settlement was the Rayotwari settlement. This settlement was started by Reed and Munro in the year 1820. It started in the provinces of Bombay and Madras and its settlement accounted for 51% of the total cultivable area. Its important features were the settlement was made directly with the peasants and the land revenue demand was exorbitantly high and in even cases of the natural calamities the peasants were forced to pay land revenue by selling or mortgaging the land so this process of selling and mortgaging the land led to land becoming a commodity which could be sold or bought and it led to break up of social structure in villages because land was not a commodity since ancient times it was considered a sacred the next important land revenue system was the Mahalwari system and this system was started by Mackenzie in the year 1822. It was applicable to the middle Gangetic plains, northwest frontier province and Punjab and this system accounted for 30% of the total applicable area. Uh, its important features were several villages were clubbed together and one representative was selected from collective group of villages. This head was responsible to collect the land revenue from the villages and submit to the British authority. Now let's discuss the consequences of these economic policies over the peasants. The majority of the consequences are negative and only one or two are positive. Negative consequences includes impoverishment of the peasantry, recurring famines, heavy toll of life, commercialization of agriculture, that substitution of commercial crops for food grains, fodder and other crops that proved disastrous and resulted in famines. Earlier there were natural calamities like floods, droughts and etc. But the famine was not frequent and after the Britishers famine became a regular phenomenon and large scale starvation death was a very recurrent phenomenon. And further the negative consequences include the over dependence of peasants on merchants. It led to their snatching of their lands and huge debt burden and further uncertainties of international price situations and growth of indian laborers and rural indebtedness and only one positive is its emergence of active trade in agricultural produce now let's talk about something about famine and famine commission which are the active steps which were taken by the britishers in this regard the nature what was the nature of famine it began in bengal in 1770 and ended with bengal famine of 1943 majority of the famines were in north india after 1850 large reduction in supply of food grains and fodder in the mid 19th century it became a frequent and common phenomena of famine and it led to the huge large destruction and deaths of the peasants and what were the causes the recurrent failure of the monsoon from one of the main reason of the famine and next was neglect of irrigation works by the britishers initially only some steps were taken after the 1920 absence of alternative occupations in villages and general poverty and practical absence of saving now these are the steps 
or committees or commissions which were formed by the Britishers to study the reasons and suggest suitable measures. First was in 1867, Campbell Committee was formed to inquire famine of North India. In the 1876-78, famine occurred in North India and the first famine commission of India, it's an important question market, first famine commission in India was under stretch in 1876-78 and in 1896-97, second famine commission was under Lal Commission, the name of the commission was Lal Commission and the third famine commission came from 1819 to 1900, it was under McDonald Commission and finally after the Bengal famine of 1943 in 1944 Woodhead Commission was formed. So this completes our chapter. Thank you.